Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will be covering how to assess body composition and what this means for our diet and training protocols. Before exploring how to assess body composition, we first need to understand why trainees want to change body composition in the first place. Those performing resistance training generally want to improve their body composition for the purpose of looking more aesthetic and also for general health and function. Some trainees also lift for specific sports like weightlifting or powerlifting, and some lift for transfer to athletic performance for field and court sports. However, these goals are unique to sport performance and aren't really to do with body composition. Let's now cover what tissues contribute to the body composition goals for most trainees. First is muscle mass. This is obviously how much muscle tissue we have and what muscles we want to develop. Muscle mass is an important component of body composition as it provides the shape and structure of the body underneath the skin and fat. Generally, trainees want to increase muscle size as this will have the visual appearance of muscles pushing against the skin, making the trainee look bigger and more defined. The other tissue we are concerned with is body fat. This refers to adipose tissue located underneath the skin and above the muscles. Body fat will determine how much coverage we have over the muscles and other tissues. More body fat will result in reduced appearance of muscles, while less body fat will result in improved appearance of muscles. Generally, trainees seek a lower body fat level to make muscle mass more superficially visible. So now that we know the two primary tissues relevant for body composition goals, let's explore specifically how body composition can be assessed. We can never assess body composition changes with 100% accuracy. We only have tools that provide indicators. Therefore, it should be understood that the process of improving body composition is not a completely objective pursuit. We have multiple methods of assessment, which we will now cover. The first method of assessment we have is visual appearance. This refers to looking at your physique, either in a mirror, photo, or video. While visual appearance is the most subjective form of assessment, it is also the most direct. If we think about it, Visual appearance is the primary outcome we are trying to improve, so all other measures of body composition are technically indirect, even though they might be more accurate. Visual appearance should only really be compared between similar body weights. If a trainee goes through a massing phase, they may have gained some muscle, but they will obviously have much more body fat covering this muscle, so we can't really compare this look to when the trainee is lighter and leaner. We should also be aware that it generally takes a long time to see significant changes in body composition for trained lifters. For novice trainees, visual progress may be seen on a weekly basis, but for advanced lifters, it may take multiple years to see any noticeable differences in their physique. So for most trainees, we shouldn't be comparing our physique on a week-to-week -week basis, rather it should be on a multi-month or yearly basis. This leads us onto our next assessment tool, which is body weight. Body weight is technically not a measure of body composition because it doesn't actually provide any indication of what tissues are increasing or decreasing. For example, a trainee could gain 2 kilos of muscle and another trainee could gain 2 kilos of fat and both trainees would see an increase of 2 kilograms on the scale. Furthermore, body weight naturally fluctuates from day to day based on water retention, glycogen stores and digestion. However, body weight is definitely a useful tool when used in conjunction with other assessment methods. Body weight gives a general indicator of how much total tissue we have. It doesn't tell us what this is, but it tells us how much. We can then use other methods of assessment to give us more details about what this total weight is composed of. For example, like we mentioned in the previous section about visual appearance, we can compare our physique at the same body weight at different points in time. So we know that we have the same amount of total tissue, but maybe we look bigger and leaner than we previously did. This would be a pretty good indicator that we have gained muscle mass and reduced body fat. The next form of assessing body composition we have is using girth measurements. This refers to measuring the circumference of various regions of the body. We can measure the circumference of the arms, legs, calves, waist, hips, and more. These girths can give us a general indicator of our body composition. This should once again be assessed at similar body weights because the amount of body fat we have will influence these results too. The general consensus with using girth measurements is that we should see an increase in the circumference of the muscles we are trying to grow and generally see a reduction or maintenance in waist circumference. This is because we generally hold more body fat around the midsection and less in the extremities. So if we have an increase in arm and thigh circumference and a decrease in waist circumference at the same body weight, then this should indicate an improvement in body composition. In other words, the trainee has more muscle mass and less body fat at the same body weight. 
However, this method of assessment has some potential issues with validity and reliability. Firstly, there is likely to be variation in circumference readings when repeatedly measured. The individual may not place the tape in the exact same spot every time, or you may be measured by different people at different times, or two different tape measures might not be exactly the same. Furthermore, girth measurements will differ based on if you are flexed versus relaxed, glycogen storage in the muscle, and water retention. Most of these factors can be controlled for, but it still probably provides too much room for error to be confident in the results. This is especially true for advanced lifters, who may only see a few millimetres of muscle growth over time. And lastly, girth measurements are probably not even a very valid tool to assess body composition in the first place. This is because both muscle and body fat will both contribute to changes in circumference. For example, two trainees could have the same arm girth measurements, with one having more body fat and another one having more muscle mass. So even if a trainee has gained muscle and lost body fat, girth measurements of the limbs may not even change. The next method of assessing body composition we have are the research-based technologies like bioelectrical impedance, DEXA scans, and more. There are numerous advanced technologies to assess body composition, but we have grouped all of them together because they are all fairly similar in accuracy and what results they provide. These methods are generally the most accurate way of assessing body composition, with some being slightly more accurate than others. Most of these tools provide a breakdown of what tissues total body weight is composed of. This usually gives indications of muscle mass, bone mass, and body fat. These methods are considered the gold standard assessment because they are the most accurate and direct measures of body composition. However, it should be noted that they are also influenced by things like hydration status, digestion status, and glycogen levels. And although this is the most direct measure of body composition, it is not necessarily the most direct measure of what trainees are after, which is visual aesthetics. Next, we have skin folds. Skin folds are a measure of skin thickness at specific sites of the body. This is a measurement of how much body fat a trainee has. Calipers are used to pinch the skin, and the thickness of the skin relates to how much body fat the trainee is carrying. These thickness readings are often put into math equations to estimate body fat percentage of the trainee. Using skin folds to assess body fat is probably not the most accurate way to assess body fat percentage. Furthermore, body fat percentage doesn't really provide a useful gauge for those who want to improve visual appearance. Therefore, skin folds are probably best to simply assess skin thickness, as this is a much more direct measure of how you will look. If the skin becomes thinner, then you will visually be able to see more muscle, making your appearance more defined. So the exact body fat percentage number doesn't really matter. Once again, skin folds should be used in conjunction with body weight and other tools to provide a more accurate assessment of body composition. And the last method of assessing body composition is through lifting performance. This is the least direct measure of body composition, but it still may provide some useful data. Lifting performance can be used as a gauge of muscle growth. If lifting performance is improving, then chances are muscle mass is increasing. This is by no means a direct correlation, but it may be a good general indicator. Lifting performance is impacted by many other variables independent of muscle size. Technique, body fat, nutrition, levers, neural efficiency and more all influence lifting performance in the short term. So we can't be 100% confident that changes in lifting performance are due to changes in muscle size, because so many other variables can influence performance too. However, we can look at lifting performance from a long-term perspective to assess muscle growth. If a trainee is lifting more weight or performing more reps in the same exercise that they are familiar with over a multi-month period of time, this is probably a good indicator that the prime movers of that exercise are growing. We should also consider body weight in this case, because increases in body weight alone can lead to performance improvements for certain lifts. This is once again another indicator of body composition changes, which needs to be used in conjunction with other tools. So how can we use all of these tools to assess body composition over time? There are many different ways to do so, and a combination of methods is generally the most effective. Some methods are best to assess from a long-term perspective, and some methods are best to use from a short-term perspective. Something like body weight can be taken multiple times per week as a general gauge of energy balance, but something like a DEXA scan should probably only be conducted no more than once per year. Furthermore, you don't have to use all of these tools to assess body composition, you may only select a few that you see necessary. This now leads us onto the practical side of things. What implication does this have for training and diet protocols? Well, the reality is that our body composition assessments probably won't change much from a practical perspective. It may give us a gauge of what is more or less effective, 
but ultimately our goals are still the same. Trainees will still want to increase muscle size and reduce body fat from a long-term perspective. Therefore, regardless of what our assessment tells us, we will still use resistance training with the goal of maximizing muscle growth and nutrition as a way to assist this and to reduce body fat when desired. So really, is there any point in assessing body composition at all? Well, there is, but we don't need to be extremely thorough and accurate because our goals are ultimately still the same. We may adjust our training volume or exercise selection to make training more effective, or we may increase or decrease calorie intake, but ultimately the primary principles remain the same. Therefore, trainees should probably focus on the process of training and nutrition and less on the outcome. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.